Hello, everybody. This is Carol Maletta of the Parenting 411, where we share information parents need from sources they can trust. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for another edition of News You Can Use. I have really been looking forward to tonight's guest, um, Stacy McClam. She is an educator, an author, and a filmmaker. And she is committed to revealing what is going on in our schools, the trauma that teachers and students experience. And she also has a riveting documentary that is coming up very soon. It's called Robbed, A Mother's Peril, the Kelly Williams Bowler story. And a lot of you are probably familiar with that story. And she's gonna tell us some things that um, we may not know. Um, I know there's certainly um, some things that I did not realize um, in having a conversation with Stacy about that story. And certainly uh, with the college admission scandal that we all heard and read about um, earlier this year and late last year, um, when we think about the disparate treatment <laughs> in those cases, um, between how the case with Kelly Williams Bowler was handled and them, the parents in the, the college admission scandal, um, it really raises a lot of questions and really um, kind of gets folks angry about it, frankly. So I'm looking forward to this and we're gonna talk about her journey. She's had quite a journey to this space. I really admire all that she has done. So, um, Without further delay, I'm gonna bring her on and by all means, please drop your questions and comments in the, um, in the chat and I'll try to get to those. Um, we know that this is normally a uh, 30 minute show, but who knows because there's a lot to unpack with the work that she does. And I can't get her on my show during the day, um, Parenting 411 on WOLB 1010 because of, um, the time difference and also um, scheduling conflict for her. So I am really pleased to have her this evening. So I'm gonna bring her on. Hello, Stacy. Hi, Carol. Thanks so much for having me today. Absolutely, it's my pleasure. And let me just make sure, um, I'm gonna open up Facebook just to make sure that I can capture any questions that people, um, people might have. So let's see here. All right. So um, let's just start off. Um, you know, tell um, tell our viewers a little bit about who you are and um, your background, and you know, certainly like your your um, professional journey to this point. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I'm from Los Angeles um, County, born and raised, and I've always been interested in education issues. Uh, I think a lot of that that has to do with because I was bused. Uh, from six years old to schools outside of my neighborhoods. Um, it left an impact on me getting up early when it's still dark outside before everyone else is awake and you're wondering, how come you know my other friends in the neighborhood aren't up <laughs> you know getting ready to be bused to another city? So mm -hmm. um, yeah, my aunt was a teacher and she told my parents that there were schools called gifted schools, magnet schools out here in California is what they're called and that they tried to get me into one of those schools. Uh, my grandmother was a teacher in segregated Virginia and I always admired my grandmother. And so I, I knew I wanted to be a teacher and I experienced um, some injustices in the education system in high school. And I just saw a lot of training and um, discouraging counselor that, that I had and not being able to take AP classes. And so I thought I wanna be a teacher and so I did and ended up teaching across the United States, um, started in D.C. In, in your area. Yeah, I saw and, that. <laughs> yes. Um, and then after two years, I decided to go to law school to uh, for education reform reasons. And then after graduating, went back to the classroom mm -hmm. uh, just because I, I felt like I could the law, I couldn't find a way to use the law mm -hmm. uh, quickly <laughs> to make change. Right. Right. So I just decided to go back to the classroom for eight more years. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two, two years ago in 2018, I decided um, 
I, I need to change change careers. Uh, it, it, it was a good time, but it, it came to an end. So I had to pivot much like I know you did with your professional journey. So mm -hmm. it happens and mm -hmm. uh, now I'm a filmmaker. So we're transitioning into that and I'm excited about uh, the journey. It's not been easy <laughs> at right. all. Right. And I'm learning as I go and continuing to learn. So Yes, and I'm sure you know your your not only your professional training as a teacher and your experience, but also the law. I'm sure that that informs uh, the work that you're doing as well. So, you know, God uses everything. That's what I always say. Yes, <laughs> so, <laughs> definitely. Uh, out of curiosity, what um, grade level um, were you teaching? I actually had elementary, so mostly first grade. I taught first through fourth, but mm -hmm. mostly first grade and lots of issues in elementary schools. People don't know. They usually always think about secondary schools. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> yes. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, children pick up on things very early on. And so they kind of take on the labels that um, teachers and administrators might um, hang on them and and they just operate in that space and then the patterns can be set very very early on um unfortunately and and children are aware of it yes they are definitely so um tell us a little bit more i want to hear a little bit more about why you decided to not teach and um what led you to form school dismissed and also write the book mm -hmm. First of all, let me give a shout out. Um, Reginald Smith is watching with us. Thank you so hey, much. <laughs> so um, tell us about that, how you decided to leave teaching and, and how School Dismissed came about. Mm -hmm. um, well, after many years of um, just feeling like there, there was more that could be done in schools, mm -hmm. um, I just, felt like even with uh, well-intentioned teachers and administrators, mm -hmm. it's a systemic issue. And sometimes you can't get resources that you need, things to make teachers successful in a classroom, mm -hmm. you don't always have, especially in many urban schools. And unfortunately, um, even mental health professionals. Mm -hmm. So uh, in wealthier school districts, they're, they have services for students. It's not a problem. Uh, you don't wouldn't wouldn't allow certain things uh, like fights to happen on a daily basis. But somehow, when it's uh, urban schools in a different population, mm -hmm. these things it just people become immune to it, and it, it just happens, and it just seems normal, but it's not. And so, what I often saw was not only at the school site, but just policies in place that allow accountability, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I would always wonder, well, I just, I felt helpless. I felt powerless. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes people in helping professions, such as mm -hmm. uh, nurses, I know some feel this way, where you take on unconsciously the trauma of your students. So some students bring trauma to school some mm -hmm. students are re-traumatized at school and mm -hmm. some teachers are traumatized because they cannot, they feel stifled in that they want to help. They want their students to be successful, but it's not set up for them to be successful. So oftentimes mm -hmm. people say, oh, you're a great teacher. And they would say that to other teachers and we were doing our best. But to me, I knew like that's not, I could do more if I had proper resources. And mm -hmm. I just felt you know, that I wasn't serving students as best as I could. And it, it, it's not fair to the students or the teachers. And um, that's why I like your platform, because I think parents, some parents don't know about this. And mm -hmm. you, you have to understand um, how to advocate for your kids, because sometimes mm -hmm. teachers' voices aren't heard, so they can't even advocate for your kids. And there's a lot of things that happen in schools, in mm -hmm. classrooms that parents don't know about. Yeah, and, you know, and it, it's really, it can kind of be disheartening that teachers are experiencing this because, you know, on a good day, teaching is a hard job. Yes. So, and, and, and I know that. Thank you. <laughs> I, you know, 
I mean, because I can remember, um, I can remember when I was younger, you know, when I was in uh, K through 12, but certainly primarily elementary school, when I really thought that teachers had nothing to do but. <laughs> like, right. you know, if, if you, if I saw the teacher out at a, I mean, I, and as a matter of fact, it wasn't even very common that I would see a teacher out at a store or something, but I thought that they went right home and worked on our papers. I mean, you know, it just, you know, I didn't even think about them having a whole other life and needs and worries and, you know, all of that. But they do, they, you know, they're passionate. Usually when you go into this field, you're just so passionate. You really like to pour into children. You like to see those light bulb moments. And so when you feel like uh, your hands are being tied behind your back just because of bureaucracy or um, in, urban, in urban settings where um, there's no faith in the students, they're not being encouraged to reach their full potential, they're being labeled, there are assumptions made about them, it is traumatic, you know? Mm -hmm. And then in addition, you see your children, um, see your students coming in. Um, it's just, uh, I can imagine, you know, that it, it really is traumatic. And I, and I, that's why I really love that you are, you know, telling this story. And, you know, certainly here in the middle of this pandemic, I mean, it's so much is being revealed about our system here in our country, systems in our country, um, that you know this pandemic is revealing a lot, and I'm just hoping that we um, reform a lot of areas, and certainly education um, is one of them. So, tell us about School Dismissed. Yes, so um, it's a book. It started as a book uh, that mm -hmm. I wrote in 2018. Uh, I initially was writing it as therapy for me. <laughs> I wasn't intending to write a book. And then it, it turned into a book. Mm -hmm. And then um, two years later, I decided that I wanted to form a film production company, Bridging Education, Film and Law. Mm -hmm. um, because I think each of those uh, areas are unique, but Mm -hmm. important for change to happen because, I mean, we've been dealing with the education system forever and things don't change with policies and laws. And so sometimes you have to expose and to hold people accountable, people need to actually see it. Mm -hmm. And then that, when people see it's not morally right, something's mm -hmm. wrong with this, oh, this is what's happening. And they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we have to do something about this. Uh -huh. And so that's the intention of making this documentary. And then I hope to have narrative feature films about education after the documentary. Um, so yeah, just trying to expose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that too, because we're going to dive into Robbed as well. But yeah, I was wondering about your plans um, in the future about how you'll be looking at education. So, yeah, I think it's a, a great time. And um, I think, you know, some of us knew that these things were going right. on in, in the um, urban schools and, and we knew about the inequities in the school systems and things like that. But, um, you know, other people who just were not as enlightened. So I'm hoping that um, people are going to be now more open to work like yours um, to really finally do something. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, um, I think you talked a little bit about what you witnessed in the various school settings um, that bothered you. I mean, um, the how behavior was 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 managed or not, and mm -hmm. um, the difference in the resources at the different schools. Um, you know, it was just really a haves and a have nots kind of situation um, going on. Um, is there anything else that you saw that um, concerns you? Um, I, it's just, there's, there's so many things, um, from teacher retention. Um, I mm. saw in some schools where just high teacher turnover rate in the middle of the school year, like oh, wow. 20 teachers maybe coming through the school. Um, you don't know if someone is that a new teacher or is that a parent? Cause it's, it's just a new face. Wow. Um, yeah, it, when teachers are leaving like that, uh -huh. it's a problem. <laughs> like, uh -huh. some there's a reason why they're leaving, and it, it needs to be addressed. And it affects other staff members. They uh -huh. 
start to have a low morale about the school. Well, why did that teacher leave? Um, you know, what's wrong with the school? Am I working in a, you know, a negative place? Why am I in this negative environment? Mm -hmm. And then with that kind of attitude, you're expected to teach and be positive. But mm -hmm. the kids, as you stated, the, the kids already know. So mm -hmm. they're not coming to school as if it's a happy, fun place to be, which learning should be fun mm -hmm. and joyful. But mm -hmm. oftentimes it's not. So it, there are certain... Um, and that's the that's why I want to show it because it's hard to explain for mm -hmm. people. They they need to see it. It's mm -hmm. things like uh, just the the walking to the cafeteria or the lineup for the cafeteria line during lunch. Is it a safe place or is there fights? If there are always fights every day, mm -hmm. why? And what are we going to do as a school community to? Mm -hmm fix this because the kids should not be fighting every day. It shouldn't, right. even if kids have their own issues at home, if the school environment is positive mm -hmm. and organized and structured, then kids feel safe mm -hmm. and they're not naturally going to fight. And if they do, then there are people there such as counselors or other mental health professionals to talk with the child and let them express themselves so that we don't have fights. Yeah, I mean, because you know, I always think about school, and I know I, uh, I wonder what you think about this. That it's really should be um, children should really feel like they're part of a community. You Definitely. Know? You know, and like where their um, expectations and agreements about what happens in the community, and everybody feels a responsibility for um, following those expectations and recognizing that um, when one person breaks rules or breaks the agreement, you know, social agreement, that there's an impact, you know, our community is less than it could be. You know, I know I thought about, I thought a lot about that when I was, um, you know, when my children were in school and, you know, when we had options of which school you could go to, that's what I always looked for was community. Do these children feel like they're a part of something? And because I felt like that when I was growing up. You know, um, and I, I think that's it should be a carefree place. And that sounds like that's what you you um, you feel as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So now let's talk about um, your film production company. And so your first project is robbed. Right. Is that your first project for the film company? Yes. OK. It is. Um, it is. So I'm okay. completely new at this. Okay, wait, when you froze for just a second. Um, so yeah, so this is gonna be your first project. So let's um let's tell everybody about that. What is it about? Okay, yeah. So again, it's called Rob of Peril, the Kelly mm -hmm. Williams Bolar story. And mm -hmm. if you all remember back in 2007. Kelly is a, a divorced mom and she was jailed for enrolling her daughters into her parents' school district. She used their address um, mm -hmm. after her home was burglarized. And so this is a crime. It's a crime to do that. And, um, now Kelly believes she had, she lived both places. The, the mm -hmm. girl had rooms at her parents' house and she had a room there. She helped pay some bills. And so many it's a cultural bias in the law, I think, because many um, black grandparents specifically um, help with raising the kids. And so Kelly was um, a teacher's assistant. She still is. And she was going to school at the time at night. And so mm -hmm. she worked full time during the day. And um, after school, she went to uh, the university for her classes to become a teacher. And so it naturally made sense after her home was burglarized, she was concerned about the safety of her kids. So mm -hmm. she used her parents' address. And so, um, yeah, it's just something to explore. There are many layers of injustice in, in the story. It's a very complicated story and we want to show both sides of the story, but mm -hmm. it, it touches on some really important issues. And as you stated earlier, um, there are some parents who intentionally uh, pay to get their, you know, kids into better schools, and they don't receive the same amount of uh, jail time or fines. 
Right. And, you know, I didn't even know until we had our conversation, I didn't even know about the part about her home having been burglarized and that this was really a matter of safety. And then the whole thing about, you know, you bring up something very important about the generational support, you know, the parents, the grandparents um, helping with the raising of the children and that they do spend, a, they probably spend a fair amount of time with their grandparents. So it seemed, you know, would make sense that they could go to that school. And, um, you know, and then when you just see that, you know, you have other people that, I mean, I don't even want to get into this, the, 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 <laughs> the egregious nature of their, I mean, the child that they presented was not even the child that was was not truly representative of the child's abilities or anything to get into the school. And then we're not even going to talk about the bribery and all of that that went on. And so, you know, and, and this woman, you know, she did she have to serve any um, jail time or what happened? She did. So initially she had three f felonies against her. And uh, her sentence was five years. And because of public outcry, the governor uh, reduced her sentence to misdemeanors. So she served nine out of 10 days. And um, it's, it's, like I said, a very complicated story. Her father was actually tried with her and um, died in prison on other questionable charges. And so, it, it really affected the family. And it's just interesting that many, some people, they portrayed her as per, uh, stealing an education is what it was, a uh, grand theft. So. Right. And the, and the thing is, you know, we, um, I think most of us that heard about it, and I'm just judging from the commentary that I saw on Facebook or whatever, I mean, even within our community, we did, we're not aware of kind of the backstory, you know, again, about the grandparents and, and all of that other stuff. But we just thought that it was um, she wanted her children to go to a better school because of, there are some parents that do that as well. Mm -hmm. right. And it's like, well, she should, you know, she shouldn't need to do that. All the schools should have the same stuff. Like she shouldn't, you know, I mean, you know, she shouldn't even feel like she should have to do that. Like we, you know, we had, you know, we, there was, um, everybody could relate to that. Like you want your children in a safe school or you want your children to have a good education. And the way it was um, portrayed in the media, it was like exactly what you said, that it was like, oh, she just was trying to get them in a better school. I mean, we'll get, yeah, get them in a better school and she, that's stealing because like, you know, some jurisdictions, if you want to do that, if you want to have your child go to um, go out of district, uh, you have to pay tuition. Right. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I mean, either way, I mean, I could re I mean, I could just relate to that. I mean, you know, and if you would fix the schools for everybody, then nobody, you know, you know, her situation is different. But um, the people who do try to put their children in a better situation, they wouldn't need to do that if you would fix their school, you right. know, mm -hmm. and, you know, see everybody value all children and um, seek to um, provide that foundation for all of them to reach their full potential. I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of really um, what it's all about. So where are you in, like, what stage are you in with the documentary? How's that, how's it coming along? Yes. So we're still in production. Uh, we started in January mm -hmm. and we uh, will continue production next year. Not quite sure how long um, we'll film next year, how much we're still trying to decide some aspects of the story. Mm -hmm. But we uh, plan to apply to festivals, film festivals in 2021 and hopefully have a 22 festival, 2022 film festival run, and then Good. hopefully 2023 or maybe sooner. We'll see. But um, so, what does what does she think about all of this? Um. Well, I mean, I, I do speak to her, of course, because I'm, I'm working with her. She's a participant in the documentary. The story is about her, so mm -hmm. I don't want to speak exactly what 
I don't know what she thinks, but I this can't is generally I mean. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I mean, she, I think, is happy to be able to give her perspective, um, oh. say what she felt. And, you know, her family is in the documentary as well to say what they felt. It, it affected the whole family. So it wasn't just her. Uh-huh. And um, just showing what she does in the community. As I said, she's a teacher's assistant. So she's very involved with education issues and has been for more than 20 years. She's been a um, a motivational speaker and an advocate for education issues. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, I mean, I think she's she's happy to, just to get her voice heard and for there to be uh, both sides of the story presented. Right. And and the more I hear about her, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm just so happy that you're telling this story because, you know, you're exactly right. They treated it like she was being sneaky or, you know, like you said, stealing an education. And I'm kind of like, well, why, did, well, you know, why would a mother who loves her kids, you know, you ought to be addressing why she felt like she needed to do something. If, if you think that. You, that why she needed to do something like that. If, if you know, why somebody would steal an education in America? What's wrong with our system? Nobody should have to feel like that. And she didn't steal an education. That wasn't what she was doing. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm glad that, um, I'm definitely glad that um, we're going to be able to hear, learn more about, um, learn more about her because I definitely was, um, you know, fascinated by, you know, a lot of the, the details. Mm-hmm. So, um, so what are some other areas of um, education that you want to explore? Well, there's a lot. <laughs> um, it, a, a lot of the hidden issues, like I uh, talked about before, it's tracking is one where s- students are placed. Well, there are many different ways kids can be tracked, but it could be in terms of uh, reading ability levels, um, of course, kids are at different levels, but the levels uh, should be fluid. <laughs> you uh-huh. shouldn't always have to be in a low reading group. The goal should be for you to progress. Um, mm-hmm. And teachers do have to different, differentiate their instruction. So I understand that. But um, that's one example with reading groups. But then it's also at the secondary level, for example, who gets in honors classes, who gets in AP classes, advanced placement classes, who gets into the magnet programs or gifted classes. Mm -hmm. And there it's a problem when you see white and Asian students in advanced placement classes only when if the school majority school student body is black and uh, Latino, for example, that's how it was at my school. Mm. And I'm like, well, how come there's not more black and uh, Latinx students represented? Mm -hmm. In AP classes, I wasn't even able to take AP classes. Um, My high school counselor did not recommend me. And so I could not take Mm -hmm. AP classes. And Mm -hmm. so my mom went to the school and still that was not enough. And that was just an arbitrary rule that you had to have a counselor's uh, letter of recommendation. Mm -hmm. Well, what if what if she doesn't want to recommend you or he doesn't want to recommend you for whatever reason, even if your grades show? Why is that a determining factor? So there's a lot of gatekeepers and things that uh, Mm -hmm. people in the the public do not see, or if they do, they don't know how to question it. And I think we need to question it. Parents Mm -hmm. need to speak up, um, even though my mom wasn't necessarily successful in getting me into advanced placement classes. Mm -hmm. um, The the curriculum is different. The instruction is different. And Mm -hmm. you're, you're not, it's not, equal. And I think even if people say if, if, if it were uh, not an AP class, if you put those students in an AP class, mm-hmm. see if they succeed, they might just because of the mentality of the class and because they feel like they are at that advanced level. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so um, tracking is one example. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely teacher trauma and uh, teacher retention. I think that's very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, Teachers see a lot and right. um, I want teachers to have a voice mm-hmm. um, because often teachers are left out of decisions and we know what's what the kids need, but we're mm-hmm. often silenced and I don't like that. Mm-hmm. Um, what other issues? School culture mm-hmm. issues and, and accountability. Mm-hmm. I think the districts should. So we have scheduled um, 
observation times where people from the district will come and check mm -hmm. out the school, but everyone knows the date that they're coming. So, okay. you know, yeah, a week before every, the, the principal has uh, the janitor scrub the floors extra. Yeah, just make everything real pretty and we're supposed to be on our best behavior. I want you to come unannounced. <laughs> right. Pop up at the school and see the fights, see the real deal. That's what you need to see. Don't, because it's a facade and, and I could not stand that. That's yeah. not okay. And you, you, you mentioned the, the fighting and um, behavior. Um, um, did you see a lot of the, what we hear about with um, black students and um, lately in recent years, black girls being over-disciplined um, when compared to, to other people, other um, their peers? Um, well, I do know that exists, but at this time I was teaching in Los Angeles County and Los Angeles County does not allow um, what they call willful, there's a word willful something suspensions. Okay. And so basically you can't suspend students. <laughs> okay. And, and so that, um, there's some issues with that as well because then it's like, well, we let anything go and that can lead to um, not addressing sure. like the, the other end of the spectrum where you're just, sure. there's no accountability because you let kids do what they want to do. They can hit the teachers and it's okay. Wow. No, it's not okay. So although I don't, you know, support the over suspension mm -hmm. of black and brown students, there sometimes needs to be consequences, could be suspensions or it could mm -hmm. be, um, uh, restorative justice type yeah. systems in place, but that's not what happens. So if you're not going to have, you're not going to suspend students, what are you going to do to replace it? And that's the problem. That's where the resources come in. Certain schools do not have counselors or restorative justice professionals mm -hmm. to help in this area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so, what I'm wondering because I know some, I know schools in our area, in Northern Virginia, some of them have um, gone to restorative justice, but I mean, they're, it's, it's not just, they're not just paying lip service to it, but they really mm -hmm. have a, a robust program again uh, around that. And, and, you know, the, for the children to the students to really um, be actively involved and own the restoration, you wow. know, um, for the concept, you know, as, and it, it is a consequence. I mean, because mm -hmm. first of all, consequence, um, doesn't have to be negative or positive. It's just, it's something that follows an action. So, um, yeah, but they, but you know, the children have to learn a lesson or, you know, um, not in the old school punishment way, but to learn about the impact of what they did and how to, um, restore what was broken. Right. So, yeah. And I, I totally agree with you. Just, taking away suspension or any means of um, any consequence is with certain, without <laughs> something like restorative justice, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what, um, what else is, what else are you involved in right now? How has um, robbed been received so far? Have you been um, out talking about it and what are people, um, what are people um, thinking about your project? Yeah, so we, um, you know, are on social media on all social media platforms, and uh, mm -hmm. we're starting to get uh, awareness and trying to grow a community of followers around mm -hmm. um, not just the film, but the issues that uh, the film raises. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, I think people are interested. Um, I do know there's a lot of. Um, negative support. Um, and I know that because, uh, yeah, I've done Facebook ads and received a lot of negative comments. I, you know, focused on the locale of Ohio and, um, mm -hmm. Kelly's story basically divided that city and okay. people are still quite upset. So while there are a lot of supporters, there are mm -hmm. a lot of people that, um, you know, really believe she's a liar, a thief, a dishonest wow. person. And so um, there people are entitled to have their own opinion. And mm -hmm. that's why we want to give both sides in the documentary mm -hmm. uh, 
to, to see how, what solutions can be had or just maybe trying to understand something from someone else's point of view. Sure. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. There's a lot in there. I mean, it's cultural. It's you know, it's it's a it's a statement about our educational system, and um, you know, whew, yeah. There's 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 a lot there, and so I'm glad you're telling that story because you know, a lot of us don't know um, don't know the details, and and then to really learn more about her. I mean, this is someone that was you know is committed to education and and kids and, and really had been, you know, it was like her life's work almost. I mean, this mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, so she was just really trying to do something to, um, you know, protect her children and have them in, a, in a, a, the right situation. But this is also someone that, um, you know, she values education and, and, and knows how important it is for children to, to get those, get the foundation. So, it's a great opportunity for us to learn more about her, for sure. Yes. And I think because of the pandemic now anyway, because of what uh, this summer has uh, exposed some of us to racial reckoning and all of this stuff, um, the unfortunate mm -hmm. murders of many people, um, it these are issues that needed to be addressed a long time ago. So it's yeah. things in, in this particular story, such as residential segregation, uh -huh. um, redlining, uh -huh. uh, portrayal of black mothers and girls, uh -huh. um, legal injustices or cultural bias in the law. So many issues that this story raises. So I, I, I think people, um, I don't want to, I think there's definitely many supporters. I think people are kind of hopeful maybe mm -hmm. at, a, at this kind of low point in our time um, during the pandemic. It, I think exposing things would bring people hope. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, yeah. No, I no, I totally agree with you. And then there's something about timing too. And I think with all that we've been through, you know, everybody talks about 2020 and wanting it to go away and all that. But with all we've been through, I mean, this is this is a the time for this story to come. Like if it is if it had come before now, if you know, and honestly, if uh, the 2016 election had gone another way, not sure we'd be in the place right. to receive this the way we are now. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm glad that it's coming up and, and, you know, it's just interesting to me how, um, you know, yes, people are entitled to their opinion. So I'm just kind of, but I still have to say, if you think that what she did was stealing an education and I mean, well, then what of, you know, the folks in the college admission scandal? I mean, what, what was that, <laughs> you know? So um, so why don't you tell um, our viewers where they can learn more about you and um, also the documentary? Sure. So you can find out about me at schooldismissed.com. And I'm on Stacy McClam on all social media. That's Stacy with an IE. Mm -hmm. And then the film website is Robbed the Doc. So R O B B E D the doc d o c dot com and we're at robbed the doc on all social media also and you can sign up for our newsletter to receive exclusive um behind the scenes footage mm -hmm. pictures and videos of our filming this is uh, this saturday will be our sixth film shoot and it'll be in ohio and then the week after we're doing zoom interviews because we're not flying during COVID uh, with the crew. So all of Kelly and her family and Ohio based um, interviews with community people will be in Ohio, but the rest, mm -hmm. and we did filming in LA in right. person. We mm -hmm. all were tested, got tested each time with mm -hmm. COVID and showed our results and wore masks. But um, the interviews with other people will be on Zoom and those will be next weekend. So mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're making progress. It's exciting. Okay. Yeah, and they can. And did you mention social media, Instagram, and all of that? Did you say that? Yes. Yeah, so it's on all social media: uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So it's um, Rob the Doc and 
Stacy Stacey Matt, Matt Clam. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is great. Well, thank you again for joining. And um, I can't wait. Maybe when it's released, you can come back. But um, I am really, um, really looking forward to this project because I think um, I just think there's a lot of people don't know and understand about this. And I think this now is the time. Um, you know, some of us, um, we already know, but we just want the rest of you all to learn. But um, there, there's some people that um, I think they might be open in a way that they might not have been, um, mm -hmm. you know, before. So I'm, I'm hoping. So I'm thank hoping you. Again. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again. And um, to those who have tuned in, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Catherine. It was great to have you with us this evening. And um, and of course you can, as always, catch it on replay. I will um, host a watch party. I hope you'll tune in and also um, visit all of um, visit all of Stacy's um, social media follower, visit her website and learn more about this so you can be ready for when the documentary comes out. So <laughs> thank you so much, Carol, for the platform and for having me as a guest. This is powerful work that you're doing. It's so important to give parents a voice and to um, educate and, and learn from other parents on, um, you know, just children and what's going on and behind the scenes of these systems and just yeah. being a, a team member with the other individuals in your kids' lives, whether that's the teacher or doctor, whoever, it's it's in a, a team effort. Oh my goodness, yes, absolutely, it, it definitely is, um, and it's good for children to know that the people around him um, or her that uh, they're encountering that they're all on the same page, they're all working together to help them to. Um, create the life that's going to be fulfilling and um, for them. So that's great. And thank you so much for your support. Yes. Thank and, you. Yeah. So with that, I will sign off. Thank you again, everybody for tuning in. Um, again, you can continue to follow um, the parenting 411 on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and invite your friends to the parenting 411 community group. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Thanks. Okay.